Okay, welcome back to Cinderella Phenomenon. Um, we left off on chapter four, Girlfriends, so here we go. Warian, if you don't come at me like it truly meant to stab me, you'll never land a hit. Yes, ma'am. Um, yes, sir. It has been about two weeks since I first saw Karma here in the forest, practicing with Garland. I have come here every night since then, though I never stay as long as Karma since I actually have work to do in the mornings. All right, here I come. Their two swords clash and Karma laughs as he throws Warian back and taps her lightly on the shoulder with a sword. That makes four hits and that one was easy. Is that the best you can do, Warian? I notice that every time Karma practices with Warian, he's in his missed Karma disguise. He says it is because of the curse and because he does not want Warian to fall in love with him. Isn't he being overdramatic? I doubt someone like Warian could fall in love with Karma. Be subtle and quiet. Garland tells me that you're usually good at that. <clears throat> I am, sir. Then why the exception today? Ah, sir. Darling, what happened to be because of the way I'm dressed, would it? Are you still not used to it? <gasps> Hit the nail on the head, have I? It is not very chivalrous to hurt a lady, of course. But that logic appeal applies to men as well. <clears throat> An enemy is an enemy, Warian. Even if your enemy is a delicate flower like myself. Delicate flower? Warian, you should hit him on the head for that. But princess, he is not delicate at all. Warian laughs in her scowl at her. Is she laughing at me? You and Karma seem to get along. I doubt it. Oh, princess, you wound me. You always say that. You wound me where Warian's blade cannot. Something flashes in Warian's eyes as she readies her sword again. Karma stands ready as Warian rushes at him with her sword. Their swords clash again. I wonder. Karma, your back's open. <gasps> Karma turns. Warian taps him on the shoulder and laughs aloud. I did it. A single hit. It looks like you have a weakness too, Karma. <gasps> no, it wasn't a weakness. It was a lack of sleep catching up with me. Why did he listen to me? He told Garland the other day that it was crucial to only listen and watch the most important things. All right, practice is over for now. I can see Garland coming for his practice. Karma walks to a corner to have a drink. I should probably head back to the tavern soon, but there is something I want to see first. On her way out, Warren gives a seldom, solemn look, nod to Gar Gar <coughs> a solemn nod to Garland. She paused to say something to him, and he looks at me, and then looks at me, noticing my vague curiosity. I was just mentioning what a good swordsman Karma is. I have seen him fight, and Karma is a good swordsman. There's no doubt about it. Yet he is practicing with him really. Yet is practicing with him really so special. He is fast on his feet and quick with his reactions. He is an excellent person to train under, even better than most of the commanders in the palace. I can second that. Even better than Ross. Remember him? The first commander was we trained under. The one who pun that punished slow learning with extra exercises. You always had to do more exercise than I did. Something about you being distracted? I, I was watching the way you swung your sword to make sure you didn't hurt yourself. You've always been overprotective. Well, I... They both suddenly stop to look at Karma, who's smiling slyly on the side. Why does he have that look on his face? Well, that's a sign. We can't keep the commander wait. Well, that's a sign. We, mo we can't keep the commander waiting. Garland shakes his head, his expression snapping back into something more serious. Right. The two exchange quick farewells before Warian waves and steps out of the clearing, leaving Garland with Karma. <clears throat> You're in a dress today. Are you two really so opposed to hurting me when I'm in a dress, or are you worried about ruining it? No. It's just so strange. She moves so well, even in a long dress. But yes, Warian did mention almost stepping on it once. Impossible. I am the picture of ele uh, elegance. I almost said legacy. Of course, sir. Karma shrugs Garland's common off. The two ready their swords and get right into practice. Warren is taking over Garland's patrol now, so that Garland can get in some practice time. 
So, Garland, have you told Warren yet? <gasps> no. The conversation that Karma always has with Garland is the real reason I stay behind and watch them practice. I don't understand why Garland answers Karma's question of doing so makes him so depressed. Will he ever say anything to her, Garland? Why don't you just confess to her already? Karma lands an easy hit on Garland who sighs in response. Whenever Garland thinks about worrying, he gets distracted. I do not understand his feelings at all, but seeing him remain quiet prostrates me. Warren is talented and poised. I could never be good enough for her. You'll never win a woman's heart if you don't compliment her looks as well, Garland. Well, she's pretty too, beautiful, and then there's me. Aren't they both knights? Haven't they both tra been training together for a long time? Let's just say something to her. I can see why I wouldn't tell her. <laughs> just say something to her. Well, I... All you ever do is talk about her. Even Karma says your concentration is lacking because she's always on your mind. <gasps> so just tell her. If she does not like you back, then that's it. If she doesn't like me back. Confessions are hard, princess. Very tedious. You're only saying that because you're dramatic about everything. The very nature of love is dramatic, darling. But enough idle chatter, sir. Let us continue our training. I end up staying longer than I intended. By the time I consider returning the tavern, Garland and Karma are wrapping up for the night. I have a question for Karma, so I wait until Garland leaves before I approach him. You're still here, princess. Were you seeking out alone time with me by chance? I have enough of that every day when we run errands. I just have a question for you. You always come to the right person. What can I do for you, Princess Natalie? You ask Garland the same question every time you train, and he always tells you that he cannot confess. Carmen has an acknowledgement, but his attention is on his sword. He inspects it carefully before sheathing it. It frustrates me. You're frustrated? That look of his always annoys me. Oh my. It is annoying. Do you want to ask me why you won't confess because you're so frustrated? Yes. I suppose after almost two months, I do know, I do know you are a bit, you a bit better. You do not know anything about me, and I do not know anything about Karma either. Confessing isn't easy, dear Natalie. Dear Natalie, surely must realize that the possibility of rejection is a significant deter deterrent. That's true. But if you never ask, you never get an answer, and the stress of worrying stays with you and ruins everything. Why are you staring at me? Is that the reason you're so blunt, Princess? Blunt? You are far more blunt than I am. Princess Natalie, truly are amusing. You're as sharp as a knight's blade. I am not amusing. That is a matter of opinion, darling. You really is ins inseparable. And yet I still come to him for advice. The scariest part of the confession is the possibility of rejection. Can you imagine loving someone and then finding out that they don't feel the same way about you? My thoughts shift to the king. My chest tightens. Princess Natalie? Karma reaches out a hand and brushes a strand of hair out of my face. I slap it away without realizing. He pulls his hand back with a gentle sigh. My apologies, princess. No, I cannot imagine. No. Loving someone and finding out they do not feel the same way. I always knew my father never loved me. My understanding is different from what karma is referring to. Besides, I no longer hold my love my any love in my heart for the king. I have already given up hope on him. Right? It is a good thing you haven't experienced rejected love, princess. It is one of the worst feelings. Karma asks to be alone, so I return to the tower by myself at night. Ooh, Karma. Karma, 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 Chameleon. <clears throat> oh, well. I do not know why I agree this when nothing changes. Today, I am once again out in town with Karma, running errands. Since we've been partners, he insists on me coming with him every day. Why do you need a new dress? Because the lady needs all kinds of dresses in her closet. Variety is key when you want to make a good impression. Why would he want to make a good impression on people in a disguise? A disguise is meant to conceal you. It does not exist to be flaunted. Oh no, dear Natalie. No, darling. I only wear the disguise to stop the curse from working on people. It's not really meant to conceal anything but the fact that I am a man. Being doted on by a married woman or by a woman in love with another man is especially troubling. Is the curse really that powerful? Karma leads me over the dress store and her conversation pauses. When he goes to the store owner to give him specifications for a new dress. When we leave, Karma suggests going someplace to reward me for all my hard work. You're treating me? Why wouldn't I, darling? You've been helping me for a while now. What is this feeling? Gratitude? 
Karma does owe me for everything that I've done for him, so why do I feel like this? You know, it wouldn't be much easier for me to for you to just help me carry bags. Oh, there. Let's buy one of those cupcakes. Karma cuts through my suggestion easily. Does he really dislike work so much that he'd rather pay me off for helping him? Karma takes me to the stand showcasing all kinds of cupcakes. There are some with colored frosting, others with fancy decorations. Some are especially eye-catching, like a bright blue cupcake decorated with little stars. Anything catch your fancy, ladies? All of them, actually. Alas, I do not think eating them all would be good for my diet. What do you think, Princess? We'll share one. I turn back to the cupcakes, which I realize are big enough to share between two people. Am I choosing one for myself or one with that karma would like? I guess he is treating me, but... Two cupcakes catch my eye. One is a tiny little creature sitting on top of the frosting. It seems to be a little lizard of sorts. Though it is strange, the colors remind me of Karma's dress. The other cupcake is decorated with little white chocolate pearls. Those pearls are small and somehow cute, but Karma might like the other cupcake. <clears throat> oh, so it's between those two. Which one would you like, Natalie? Uh, I'm gonna do the lizard. I think I'm gonna give it to him. I'll have that one. The one with the... Oh my, is that a chameleon? A chameleon? It is a chameleon. Oh, that's adorable. Sir, we'll take one of those. I hope it's not a real chameleon. I was thinking you'd like it for the colors, not the chameleon. Whatever that is. Let's go enjoy this somewhere else, shall we? Oh, look. Karma leads me in the middle of the plaza and the two of us find a table. He walks off to get a fork and a knife before returning and handing a set to me. Do you really need a knife and fork to eat a cupcake? So before we got your address and you distracted me with cupcakes, we were talking about your curse. Were we? It's not an interesting topic. I was glad that we had gotten off that tangent, to be honest. Why don't you want to talk about it? You have your secrets, just as I do, Princess. But the whole point of pairing up is to help each other with our curses. Princess, you want to help me? Only because it's necessary that I help him so he can help me. I haven't made any progress helping you, though. You said you would provide me with opportunities. I'm not very good at them, am I? I'm sorry, Princess. Well, I... I don't think I've done anything for you, either. But Princess, you've been helping me for the last few weeks. Whether or not it is an obligation, you still are good company. <gasps> good company? No one has ever told me that before. They only chide me for being difficult to speak with. Karma starts cutting the cupcake. Oh, it's a... Big chameleon good. His knife sliding through frosting cake with ease. I've definitely never seen such refined manners for a simple dessert. What was your life like before this curse, princess? I've no need to tell you any of that. No, it's not necessary, but I am curious. Would I be doing a good deed and telling him? I don't think so. How about we trade off fact for fact? You give me a story day and I'll give you one tomorrow. What makes you think I'm interested in your life? Well, you do keep asking me about my curse. Only because we are working on breaking our curses. Okay, then. We won't talk about the past or any secrets. We can talk about the cupcake instead. This cupcake instead? What? Why does he always insist on changing the topic? Karma cuts the chameleon on top in half. I notice that he gives himself the head, which is a lot cuter, while he gets stuck with the tail. Chameleons are little lizards that can blend into their surroundings. He is not willing to go this far to avoid the subject. When I was a child, my father used to call me Chameleon. Karma, 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 Chameleon. What? I hid a lot to avoid responsibilities. Oftentimes, no one could find me, not my father nor the servants. If he had servants, then that makes him... a noble. One day, I was out searching for a mythical creature in our garden, and I came upon this Chameleon. It was a silly, small, little lizard, but I only found it because it was looking for something fantastic. The lizard on the cupcake does not seem all that fantastic. My father explained what it was to me, and then he started calling me a silly little chameleon. It was ridiculous, but he said I was always very good at hiding, so it suited me. What is it, princess? Seems like you're still good at hiding. You hide behind your disguise and keep many secrets. Suppose I'm still a chameleon, then. <laughs> I don't think that nickname makes any sense. Sometimes I don't have to. Nicknames don't have to make sense to be endearing, princess. Can I please just get back to the subject at hand? Yes, this cupcake. If you insist on sharing a story for a story, then I will tell you something about me. Oh? You didn't seem the type to want to share. I normally do not see any reason for sharing things about my past, no. Mother once told me that to confide in someone else was a weakness. 
but more than that, I was always worried that others would judge me. No one ever wanted to listen to me. I know enough about others' opinions of me, no matter to know that they think I am the one at fault. Always. I wouldn't judge you, princess. I mean, I wouldn't judge you for not wanting to say anything to me. I divulge nothing to you after all. Story for a story. That is the deal, right? I expect you to keep to it. Or rather, fact for fact. It is not like I have to tell him everything, just something about myself. I will tell you about my life at the palace. It's not as if it's a secret. Though I doubt Karma would understand. Ever since Mother died, the palace has been a cold place. <gasps> Why the surprise? Is it because you see Emmeline and Rod and assume we are all one big happy family? I do not have to admit that Princess Emmeline seems quite gentle. Prince Rod is quiet, but he seems like an honorable man. When I saw you in the princess at the dress store, Princess Emmeline seemed very nice, is she not? Her kindness is fragile at best. She tries far too hard for it to be genuine. Her instance is irritating. Her insistence is irritating. I have never wanted to be friends with her. The king took a second wife after my mother died, as if she never mattered to him. Karma is silent and I continue to talk, my emotions loosening my tongue. I had meant to stop there, but the words kept coming. The only one who ever showed me any affection in the palace was Mother. The king never paid much attention to me in the first place, but he treats Ron and Emmeline far better than he has ever treated me. What was your mother like? All my fondest memories are of her. She was always with me in the palace, teaching me right from wrong. She taught me how not to show weakness, who to speak with. Who to speak with? Needless conversation is useless. People are often very likely to lead you astray. That was the reason I never saw any reason to speak with the townsfolk. Will he judge me as everyone else does? No, princess, I'm not judging you. I'm just a little sad. Sad? Why would he be sad? It sounds like he lived an empty life. It was not an empty life. But it sounds as if your mother separated you from everyone. That's true. It wasn't as if the townsfolk would have accepted me anyway. Mother said they were not to be trusted. Princess, about your mother. I will not hear you speak ill of mother. No, I only have a question about about your mother. Karma coughs and a pause to stare at him as he clears his throat. What is it? This? Oh, gods. I heard the change immediately. His voice is lower, far lower. The soft gentleness gone. Karma puts a hand to his throat and grumbles. Karma's voice is teetering on the edge of sounding unmistakably male. I've always wondered how he's able to change his voice, but I always forget to ask him about it. What happened to your voice? Oh, it's Miss Karma. I turn to see a young market girl approach and she looks at Karma adoringly. I've always wanted to speak with you, Miss Karma, ever since you complimented my dress that one time in the dress store. <gasps> your dress is as lovely today as always, Miss Karma. She's not speaking because she's got the deep voice, Karma. Miss Karma, are you okay? I am quite fine. I can't help but giggle as a girl takes a step back, looking shocked by Karma's- Oh, I am fine. Okay, look shocked at Karma's now deep voice. Karma curses again in his deep voice before forcing a bright smile on his face. Excuse me, I'm feeling under the weather. I noticed that he is trying to change the pitch of his voice, but the highness is only annoying rather than soothing out. So try to the weather. Oh, I'm sorry. Karma turns to me urgently, but I'm too amused to offer any sort of assistance. What is it, Miss Karma? Karma's smile is forced and his eyes are glaring at me. I laugh once again, not able to help myself. His expression softened, but only slightly. I'm gonna attempt to leave Karma. I think we had better get going. Karma nods his head. I'll have explain- I'll have explained it to do if we just sit here. Is there nothing I can do to help you two? No, obviously not. I'm sorry. That was kind of rude. He does not look amused. Why? I was only trying to get us out of here faster. Leaving. Bye-bye. He takes my hand and curtsily, politely, curtsies politely the girl as he pulls me away. Karma, you sound sick. It's run out. Run out? The boosh and the parfait makes for me. I must have talked too much. You talk too, talked too much? Karma puts a finger to his lips as we stroll through town. He shakes his head with making it clear that he won't speak to me until later. When we arrive at the tavern, it is already dark. Karma pauses and turns to look at me. What? You have a nice smile, Princess Natalie. I'm glad it could make you laugh. Well, of course I laughed. You sounded ridiculous. It's worse than a ridiculous just to see you smile. 
You and Rumble really are the same. The common doesn't face him. He smiles widely as he leaves for his room. <sighs> I'm glad it can make you laugh. I cannot get those words out of my head, even though I'm supposed to be resting for the night. I think I should go see if Karma's practicing with Warren and Garland. I leave my room and go down the reception room. Delore and Parfait let me go to the forest tonight alone now, since they know that I'm meeting up with Karma. Parfait is in the reception room tonight reading a book. I was always told reading in the dark was bad for eyes. Oh, Princess, I didn't see you. I noticed that she's closed a book and I can now read the cover. She is reading Cinderella. That's my fairy tale curse. She probably was bad for me. The Great War was caused by the fairy tales, right? Yes, that's right. And yet you are reading one. The curses are based off of those fairy tales, after all. But why are you reading Cinderella? My curse isn't anything like the fairy tale. It's reversed. True, but the morals remain the same. In order to become Cinderella, you must be good like her. Cinderella had everything handed her by a fairy godmother. I had everything taken away. Princess, have you ever had everything taken away from you? Compared to what I used to have, what I have now might as well be nothing. You have friendships and people who enjoy your company. No one in the tavern joins my company. Are you sure about that, Princess? I think you just have difficulty trusting that we all like you. Like me? Why would you like me? You become like family here. I haven't even been here that long. It doesn't matter. Everyone here at the Martian is family. Family? You're saying that everyone in the Martian is like family? Princess, you're one of my boarders. You're more than just a regular here. You live here with us. So like I said, you're family. I speak more than the people here than I have ever spoken to my own family. In the palace, I was always alone. The only person I could speak with was Fritz. Are you going to watch Karma practice? I nod in response. Be safe, Princess. As I head the door, I recall what happened earlier today. <clears throat> Parfait, what is the potion you make for Karma? You mean the potion I make to change his voice? He begged me to help him when he first designed his disguise. Karma makes a beautiful woman, but he didn't think the illusion was complete without a convincing voice. You know how picky he is. Something else in your mind, Princess? Karma hides his curse, but I must know the conditions for breaking it, don't you? Parfait does not answer, or are you also keeping it a secret? Princess Natalie, not everyone likes to talk about their curse. I think it would be better if you asked Karma directly. I just don't understand why he won't tell me everything when I'm trying to help him. Just as you think your good deeds are difficult, there is also something about Karma's curse that he can't come to terms with. Above a hand, the necklace around my neck. I still haven't performed any good deeds. Can I really do this? I'm going now. I walk out the front door and into the forest. I have said nothing about all of this, at least not until later. I wish this was all simpler and that Karma wasn't cloaked in so many secrets. Mother, I want to town. I went to town today. Oh, I told you not to go to town. Did your father take you? He told me that it would be fun. And was it? No. Everyone looked really angry at me, but I don't know why. I've told you before, haven't I, dearest one? The townsfolk are je jealous of you. Jealous? They are bitter about their lot in life, and because of that, they will seek to use you for your status. You cannot trust them, Natalie. You cannot trust anyone but me. Trust in others will lead in the heartbreak, Natalie. You only need trust me because I will never hurt you. She is very toxic. <laughs> Chapter 5. Favors and Payback. I have been in the Martian for a couple months now and I still haven't managed to do a single good deed. Today I went out to town with Waltz to buy ingredients for a parfait. The two of us have been very quiet, which is, under, um, which is uncharacteristic for Waltz. Sorry. Princess? I mean, princess? What? Did Karma explain why he wasn't coming with you today? Princess? Does Walt smell like my company? Is that why he is asking why he had to fill in for Karma? He said he was tired. Oh. Walt turns his head, his eyebrows furrowing in confusion. The town feels different today. It does? I feel as if there are people watching us. How can you tell? We practice. I have a lot of eyes on me when I'm doing my puppet shows after all. Who's Peter Pan curse? Even after, before then, I was used to being watched, I guess. Before you were cursed, why? Hmm, well, I was more conspicuous as an adult, I guess. An adult? Oh, right. You have the Neverland curse, is what it's called. You remembered. Yes, I have the Neverland curse. I told you what that was in the tavern once. You're sick as a child when you should be a man. 
boys never grow up. Kids never grow up. Right, it's a little inconvenient, but I've gotten used to it. He's technically Peter Pan, in other words. Or a lost boy. Waltz is so much more straightforward about his curse and karma. He's open about it. The two of us go into a store where we find the little cups that Parfait asked us to buy. After a pay, Waltz automatically picks up the bags. This help is nice for a change. I've become so accustomed to carrying the bags on my own. So, have you made any progress in our good deeds? You cannot see from my necklace that I am not. But you have changed. I still don't see how I have changed at all. Karma hasn't taught me anything about doing good. Sometimes in order to do good, you need to realize some things about yourself first. Maybe Karma's not so bad at helping you with that. He is selfish, flamboyant, and acts as if the world revolves around him. But you're still partnered with him. I am. I'm okay with Karma's company. Most of the people judge and shun me. But Karma hasn't done that, and he's never mentioned enjoying my company. I've become more tolerant of him, too. Oh, Princess! Waltz's eyes light up, and I see him pointing ahead to a crowd of people gathered around the center of the town. A woman stands in front of the middle of the crowd, telling people's fortunes. We should go see if we can get her fortunes told. Come on. The crowd around the woman only grows larger, until nearly half the applause has been taken up. I find myself pushed around the crowd as I try to follow Waltz. The crowd is dense, though, and in no time at all I have lost him. Waltz! I call for him, but I do not see him over the dozens of people in front of me. I will wait for him at the outskirts of the crowd. He should be able to find me. I make my way out of the crowd and to the edges of an alleyway. But Waltz still does not appear. Ten minutes go by and I consider walking back into the crowd when I hear a voice behind me. Are you looking for someone, madam? I feel someone grab my hand. I slap them away and take a step back. When I turn, I find a man standing behind me in the alleyway. Oh, that's sketchy. Didn't mean to startle you. What do you want? I want to help you return the palace, Princess Natalie. Don't trust him. You know who I am. I do, Princess, and I can lead you back to the palace. Who are you? Someone who's working for the king. But the king does not remember me. The only people that would remember me are witches, fairies, and those with a curse. Who exactly is this man? You're lying. Princess, why would I ever let you? Now come, I'm sure everyone in the palace will be very happy to see you. The man grabs my hand roughly and begins trying to pull me through the alleyway. The first thing I try to do is scream, but the man clamps his free hand over my mouth. See, that's bad. The crowd is getting farther from us and no one can see us in the shadows. Princess, I swear my word I'm bringing you back to the palace. I'm gonna wait for an opening. He will be, he will be expecting me to fight back. I have told my ground until there's an opening. What would Warren and Garland do in this situation? Nice and obedient, yeah? Better that way. After all, I'm not a bad guy. The man walks me down the hall alleyway, his hold on me is still tight. I'm forced to walk with him until I get to a dead end. Hmm, now where was the passageway he was talking about? Now it's my chance. What is this I see before me? I look up to see Karma standing on the rooftop. Ooh, he's on the rooftop stand, the rooftop right above us in his disguise, holding a sword, a broad grin on his face. Madam, you might hurt yourself playing with that sword. You might want to put it down. What is- what's this, sir? Do you feel threatened by me? You should. Karma jumps down from the bill and raises the sword in front of him. Damn, Karma. His eyes are angry, his early, jovial personality falling away. Anyone that attracts, attacks a late has to pay for the crime. That's true. Karma rushes forward, moving faster than I could see, even as a long dress. The glint of the sword caused the man to fall backwards, loosening his grip on me. I step back from the man's hold and watch as Karma points the sword at the man's neck. Oof. Now I have a sword, you do not. Do you really want to test your luck, sir? This isn't worth it. Yeah, I thought so. Dick. The man runs off, leaving me alone with Karma in the alleyway. What's this? You are a lot cockier than just a few moments ago. I breathe out slowly as relief washed over me. Thank you, Karma. Princess! Waltz approaches from where the man had run. So, did you meet the coward fellow on your way here? I mean, did you meet the coward fellow on your way here? I bumped into a man who looked as if he was running from death. Oh my, I feel oddly accomplished. Karma and Waltz's voice become faded and indistinct as my vision blurs and suddenly light on my feet. All the adrenaline from earlier has dissipated into thin air. I feel tired. Princess! Oh no! Before I can collapse, I feel arms pulling me back up. Rest easy, Princess Natalie. I close my eyes and fall into blackness. When I wake up, Anise is setting a tray of food down on my bedside table. She does not notice as I rise slowly from bed. Anise? 
Oh, Prince is here up. We were worried about you. Lady Delore and Lady Parfait said you were just out because of shock, but still. How long have I been asleep? Just a few hours, Princess. Don't worry about chores for now. Lady Delora says if you're feeling better later, you can use Mr. Broom. Just thinking about using Mr. Broom gives me a headache. Where are Karma and Waltz? Waltz is scouting the town looking for the man that captured you. And Karma? I think he might be in his room, Princess. He's got a patrol tonight, so he's resting a little bit. If he has patrol tonight, that must mean he was resting this morning, too. How did he know he needed help? Do you need anything, Princess? No, I'm going to visit Karma. What? To thank him? However he knew, if Karma hadn't been there, things would not have ended so well. It's true. Yes. That's sweet, Princess. Oh, Lady Delora wants to talk to you about what happened when you're feeling up to it. Okay. I'll wait until Lenny sleeps the room before I follow after her. It is only after I exit my room that I realize I do not know where Karma's room is. Anise must have assumed that I already knew with us being partners and all. It's fine, I do not need Anise's assistance for this. I can find Karma's room on my own. It takes me some time, but eventually I find a room with his name on the door in careful, flowery letters. It suits him. I simply open the door without thinking to knock. Uh-oh. Uh. <laughs> oh, he's got a tattoo. Of a rose. Okay, interesting. I expect to find Karma lying in bed, but instead he's standing in front of a mirror, changing his clothes. Princess. Uh-oh. I do not think I've ever seen a shirtless man before. Oh, he's smiling. Okay. Oh, indeed. He turns to me in the realization that he's standing there in just his pants. It's me hard in the stomach. My face feels incredibly uncomfortably uncom warm. Why are you just standing there? Put on your clothes. And then I notice a large tattoo on his chest. Right there. It is a rose and snared by many vines. I stare at it for a few moments before Karma puts a hand there to conceal it. It's rude to come into a ladies' room unannounced, you know. Karma slips his usual dress on carefully over his head and then approaches me. I take a step back without realizing. Karma raises an eyebrow and smiles at me mischievously. It is a familiar look, but it rattles me more that now than it ever has before. My princess, you're as red as a tomato. Are you okay? Does this man always needs to point out the obvious? I'm fine. There's no need to shout, darling. Now, what did you come here for? To see me the beautiful karma? Does any everything always have to revolve around you? Well, you're breaking into my room. I'm barely able to stubble a sigh. Well, I cross my arms and frown at him. His smile makes it harder to get my next words out. I came here to thank you. Do you want yours to see me? What did you say, princess? Princess, thank you for saving me. You are quite welcome, Princess. It was my pleasure. I should leave. Wait, what? I turn to leave, but Karma grabs me and pulls me back. Ooh, but Princess, don't you owe me something? So Karma was expected some of their return. After all, I should have known. I think you owe me an apology. You did come into my room unannounced, after all. Ooh. What is he talking about? Since you broke into my room, I demand he help me with my makeup. Then I will forget your transgression. Your makeup? Yes, darling. I thought you were resting because you were going on patrol tonight. Resting? Nonsense. I have much to do. My makeup earlier was so messy and then I washed my face in order to reapply it. I cannot believe I'm going to agree to this. Fine. Oh, what a splendid day today is. Come, princess. Let's do this by mirror. Karma pulls me over the mirror where I can see both of our faces reflected. He has a surprising variety of makeup on the dresser beside him. I do not even care that much for my appearance. Why am I helping Karma with his makeup? Now, which feature on the face do you think is the most important one to highlight, Princess? What? What are eyes attracted to most on a person's face? When they're laughing, when they smile? Why is he asking me for my opinion on something so trivial? If someone was smiling, the first feature I would look at their face is would be the cheeks, the lips, eyes. Um, to me, it would be the eyes. You always look at a person's eyes first, so the eyes. Eyes are the mirrors to your soul, as they say. Does that mean you always look into my eyes, Princess? The minute he says I look into his eyes, Karma flutters his eyelashes at me and I look back down and grumble. What was that, a trick? <laughs> he made you look. What did you think? Think? Oh, my eyes. Do they draw you in? I've never looked at Karma's eyes closely, but now that, they keep, he, that he keeps talking about them, I cannot help but look closer. His eyes are a pretty color. You don't have to answer that, Princess. I'm just kidding. Oh, of course. Your eyes, on the other hand, are beautiful. You and Rumble really are the same person. You both spout nonsensical compliments. 
nonsensical princess i'm so offended i mean what do you say i'm like that what i mean what i say i'm like that fool anyway i'll age is the order of things fine just don't make me look like a clown princess i know how much you like to tease me but i need to get out of here quickly today if you need to leave quickly shouldn't you do your makeup yourself in this opportunity to have you help me no nonsense if i can i'll have you help me with my hair some other time the way you do yours is beautiful I always put effort into my hair. His mother always emphasized the importance of looking like a princess. If I have never, but I've never received a compliment on my hairstyle before. Karma gives me his makeup supplies and I start layering the color on his face. When we are this close, I cannot help but carefully inspect every one of his features. I do not think I even did something like this with mother. You know, princess, I don't think I deserve you. Thanks. I don't think I deserve you. Thanks. I paused and raised an eyebrow at him. What? You've been helping me for a while, and I haven't helped you with your curse at all. What I did today was just coincidence. Coincidence? I had already went to town with Waltz, and so I followed you two. I only happened to catch what happened in the alleyway. You managed to see me, even when there were other, many other people who didn't. I have good eyes, probably. Probably? It is not like you to be so humble. Natalie, I'm once again offended. And why were you following us in the first place? You said you were too tired to go into town today. Hmm, I was worried. It was strange not occupying you today not accompanying you today. Worried? Why would he be worried? Karma looks puzzled for a few moments. He glanced himself in the mirror solemnly and then shrugs. Intuition, perhaps. Waltz mentioned something about feeling watched. Is there something that Waltz and Karma are watching out for that I am not? Karma closes his eyes momentarily and I take the opportunity to dust his eyes with eyeshadow. He does not seem to mind. Princess, you haven't spoken about what happened today with Dolores Perfe, have you? No, not yet. You come to thank me for- came to thank me first? Yes. Oh. Karma falls into silence and I continue to work, sweeping blush on his high cheekbones. Princess, do you know anything about the man who tried to drag you away today? No. He only, said only that he worked for the king before telling me he would take me back to the palace. I wonder how he recognized you. I was wondering that myself. How curious and alarming. The only ones who should pose a problem at this time are witches. Witches? What do they want to do with me? Well, I only mean that witches are the only ones who can see through her curses. So that, mean, so that man spoke with a witch? It's possible. But why? Why would the witches want me back at the palace? Or was that man trying to lead me somewhere else? I suppose either way, the man couldn't have wanted to bring me back to the palace for a good reason. It is, po is it possible that a witch gave a com commoner a description of you? But then why would? Karma stops talking and looks up at me with someone like sympathy. Sorry, I'm just writing my head for ideas. Are the witches really so dangerous, and what do they want with me in the first place? Rest assured, Princess, we will figure this out. I nod my head slowly. I have a lot of questions for Dolores Parfait, but it is possible that even they might not know everything. I will need to think on my own as well, just in case I decide to keep more of their secrets. I look at Carmen shaking my head. Next time I'll be more wary. I won't let myself be caught unaware. Before I realize what Karma has his hand on my cheek, ooh and is staring at me solemnly. His eyes are as cold and unmoving as steel. Princess, there won't be a next time. But that's what I said. Next time, I'll make sure that you're definitely not alone. Oh, that's nice, Karma Chameleon. Sorry. Had I been alone today, I might have actually been kidnapped. I know that, but I cannot show weakness. I just need to be more cautious. I'm not some damsel in distress, you know. Having someone at your back is far more comforting. It's true. Even on a battlefield, knights fight better together. What's wrong? Nothing. He moves his hand away from my face and stands up sighing. His eyes look suddenly distant and his posture so I think it's starting to like me. I think we're about done right here, right? I haven't finished your makeup though. Wait, why am I even concerned about that? Oh, sometimes symbol is better. Would you like me to sit back down? I do enjoy being pampered by you, princess. I take it back. We are definitely done. <laughs> we are definitely done. Good. Thank you for your hard work. In an instant. The mood changes and a bright smile once again graces Karma's face. As much as I hate to do this, I'm going to have to leave you, darling. I have business in town and then patrol later tonight. I probably won't see you for the rest of the day, but thank you. He is thanking me for putting on his makeup. It was such a small thing. You're welcome. You already thanked me, though. Well, now I can tell him twice as thankful as a normal person. That doesn't make any sense, but it's Karma. A lot of the things he says do not make any sense. I leave the room with Carmen. He leaves the tavern as I go to find Parfait and Delora. The two of them are seated together in the reception, speaking in hushed voices. When I arrive, 
They both pause to look up at me as I walk into the room. Well, well, if it isn't the princess taking long enough to come see us. And he has told us you're unharmed, so we're gonna see you safe, princess. We're glad to see you safe, princess. We're gonna see you safe. So how about telling us what happened? When prompted, I tell him everything that transpired in the alleyway. The two listen and only exchange a solemn glance when I am done. Do you know something about all of this that I don't? Why would the witches be after me in the first place? You remember when we you remember what we said about the Tenebron corrupting witches? Well, as those witches don't like seeing curses broken, they meddle where they can because they can. That is why I cast a glamour on you when you arrived here, so that you could remain hidden from magical eyes. I did it to protect you. To protect me, I feel like there is more to this than they are hiding, but I do not think any amount of convincing will get them to say anything. Forgive us, Princess. We're not entirely sure what's going on either, though if it was a human that captured you, it must be working with the witches somehow. Troublesome, to say the least, but we don't know the details yet. Give us some time to figure things out. Until we figure out who that man is and who he's working for, you need to have an es escort with you out of the Martian at all times. Do you understand? And once you figure it out, you will tell me? The two exchange another look, which only makes me more frustrated. They're obviously keeping secrets and right in front of me. We'll tell you once everything falls into place. Don't worry, Princess, we will never let you be out put in any danger. The silence is what ends our conversation. I make my way back to my room, beat heavy. I feel like a fly caught in a spider's web. I try my best to clear my mind as I return to my room. Okay. Karma. The days go by slowly and I make no progress in my curse. Karma is busy with the knights today, and Delore and Parfait are busy talking with Rumble about his curse in his room. Tonight is a perfect night to go and wander the town by myself. I need to see if I can find out anything about the witches and what is happening around the kingdom. I don't think that's a smart idea, but go ahead. Delore and Parfait are not going to tell me anything, and no one has wanted to take me out of the Martian since the kidnapping attempt. These thoughts spiral helplessly in my mind as I sit at a table. I've just finished working for the day, and the activity in the Martians begin to wind down. Garland stands at the door as the last few customers leave the Martian. Warren is walking around the room to make sure that there are no problems. Out of the corner of my eyes, I notice two men pause halfway across the room to glance back at her. I can overhear their words from where I am. Shame that she's a knight, eh? She's a proud type, too proud to let a man dote on her. Bleeding shame indeed. But do you think I might try to say something to her? You too. Oof, he's upset. Garland is just suddenly standing behind the two men, an uncharacteristically dark glare on his face. He's like, don't talk to my girl. It is there a problem? Doors are closing for the night. I'm going to ask you to please leave. No need to be up so uptight, lad. We're on our way right now. Bye. The two men walk out and Garland stands in the middle of the tavern area glaring after them. He more or less pushed them out of the tavern. If Anise had seen that, she'd probably have scolded him. Garland. <gasps> you okay? Of course. You think you can fool me? I've known you long enough to know that something's bothering you. Neither of the knights seem to notice me here. If they do, they ignore me. Warren is still looking insistently at Garland and looks down at the floor. He's shy around her. Uh, is he going to say something to her? Garland says nothing, though. He looks at loss for words. Finally, Warren reaches out and pokes his shoulder, and he looks up, startled. Still the same as always, a silent, watchful knight only says things with certainty when he knows they're the truth. Even the princess is waiting for you to say something. Both knights turn to look at me and Garland seems surprised. He's like, look at his face. Uh. I raise an eyebrow at him and he hurriedly looks away. Patrol has started soon. I'll head out first. Okay, stay safe. Garland nods at, nods at her with a little smile before he leaves the tavern. So yeah. Going to sleep soon, princess? I was just gonna head up. I stand up and get ready to move up to my room, but stop once more to look at Warian. Did you hear what those men were saying? Oh, about me being too proud or something? So she did hear them, but chose to say nothing. It doesn't bother me, they're right. I've been independent for a long time, and I would never think about pledging my safety to a man I barely know. I can take care of myself. Blunt and to the point, Warian was really admired for the honesty in the palace. The only other man men I've trusted before my fellow knights. Garland, most of all, since we've always been partners. She does not explain it further, decide that is for the better. Maybe she likes him. The sooner everyone is cleared out, the sooner I can leave the Martian. Tonight is the night I go looking for answers. Uh-oh, she's going out. She's in her cloak. 
I think she'll be taken. Sorry, karma. But I can handle myself. I'm going to prove it tonight. I may not be able to fight, but I can still be cautious enough to not land myself into trouble. Still, I do not happen to hear much of anything as I'm exploring the town tonight. I should have brought along some kind of weapon, but then I would have had to steal a knife from the kitchen. I'm not a thief. Hours pass before I pass the tavern filled with knights. Deciding that I will at least listen to what is saying at the palace, I linger by the open door and listen to what the men are saying. I hear the young Fritz is having a hard time of it. I feel bad for the lad. Even Sir Alcaster thinks he's gone mad. Well, he does keep talking about a princess that doesn't exist. A.K.A. me. Natalie. Princess Natalie. Fritz still remembers me, but how? Even his father's growing weary of his babbling. Sir Mithra is forced to break the other day. He didn't seem happy. Well, Sir Mithra must think he's crazy too. Poor Fritz. Can you keep a secret? The knights look at each other and I lean as close as I possibly can. Apparently the boy spoke some truth. But Sir Alcaster doesn't quite believe it. He's looking for the daughter of the previous queen. <gasps> and the witch had a daughter? The previous queen? Are they talking about mother? How dare they call her a witch? Apparently she did. Though I don't even remember such a girl. This is top secret stuff. I just happened to wrestle us out of one of the lackeys looking for her. What would Sir Alcaster need this girl for? I'm assuming she's dangerous and that they want to get rid of her. Are they talking about me? I'm curious, how are we supposed to find the imaginary princess anyway? Does she have any features? A, they described her features. Last man and went looking for her said she wore a special pendant around her neck. I should get out of here. I turn to leave the tavern, but my cloak snags on the door and falls to the floor, tripping me up in the process. I end up falling halfway into the tavern where the chatter abruptly stops. Is this, oh, a lady. The knights that were talking approach me. One of them picks up my cloak. I attempt to grab my cloak from their fingers, but they pull it away from me and I stumble into one of them. Madam, he moves to take my hand and then he stops when he sees my face. Her face and a necklace. You think she was spying on us? Which? One of the knights grabs me by the wrist, and that's why I should not have gone out, and pulls me toward him. He is far stronger than the man the alleyway was. Unhand me right now, I'm no witch. Then there should be no problem. We're just going to take you in, and if there's some big misunderstanding, we'll repair or you yourselves, miss. No, let me go. This behavior is not fitting of a knight. Come now, miss. Let's go back quietly. I'm going to try to convince them. Fighting back is useless when I'm outnumbered. I have to try convincing them that I'm not who they think I am. You are mistaken, sirs. I happen to overhear your conversation. It's true. Assuming I'm some imaginary princess is unreasonable. The knights look at each other. You know, she has a point. She was listening in on our conversations. Clearly suspicious. Did you not hear what I just said? I just happened to overhear it. Nothing more. You were cloaked as if you were trying to hide your features. Being out at night without a cloak is a sure way to draw attention to ladies such as myself. You know, she has a point. Night A's for Stop saying that, man. <sighs> Ned Menab, there should be no problem with us taking you back to the palace. If we are mistaken, we'll clear up the misunderstanding and pay you handsomely. <gasps> Come on, let's take her to the palace. Oh no. The knights lead me out onto the empty streets. Why? Why did I have to be so stubborn? The knights continue pulling me down the path until we come to a narrow street. Everyone who sees us walks down away to avoid the knights. There is fear in their eyes. But I've done nothing wrong. Ma'am, if it makes you feel any better, we're risking our rank on this as well. I don't know. I'm suspicious of... Who goes there? Oh, it's Karma Chameleon. I look up and it's Karma's familiar figure walking toward us. What is he doing here and why isn't he in his disguise? Gentlemen, I ask you to unhand that woman. As a knight, I will be ashamed to be seen treating a lady so terribly. And who are you? Her husband. <gasps> he did not. His what? Unhand her, gentlemen, or taste my blade. Sir, we were just going to take her to the palace, too. I will give you on the count of three. One knight keeps his grip on me as the other draws the sword. I stare at Karma continues to count through the... Uh, though the knight attacks him before his sword leaves his sheath. Karma and the knight trade blows, but it is Karma that comes out victorious. His blade slides past the knight's shoulder, distract him enough to give Karma the opening he needs. Karma reaches back with his free hand and knocks the knight out with a blow to the head. It may just be an imagination, but for a few moments I think I see the knight's blade glimmer across the surface of Karma's hand before he falls. The knight holding me holds up his hand and surrender. I yield, sir. It seems no matter how the situation turns out, you're dishonorable. But please, sir. 
she is badass. Come on. Oh, he, she, I don't know who it is. I think it's a he, but she just dresses and cross dress. Uh, uh, he. Uh, Karma knocks him out and then stands beside me as a sheath of sword. He disguises himself, in other words. Karma, I. A few moments, Natalie. Karma spends some time forcing a potion from a vial down each of the knight's throats. I watch him quietly, fearing that he might have killed them, but the knight only, knights only seem to be asleep. Sleep potion. A potion that Parfait gave me. It will make the men forget they ever saw you. That's nice. That's super cool. For this thing. And when Karma stands again, I notice a glimmer of blood on his hand and stare. You're hurt. It's nothing. I'm sorry. Come on, princess. Let's go back. He's watchful. He, like... He pulls me right out into the main street and does not let go of my hand. I cannot bring myself to speak. Karma saved me twice now. Not only that, but this time he is injured. He says it's nothing, but his bloodied hand does not move at all. Why do I have to be so stubborn and insist I can handle myself? Because I was a princess. I do not speak for a long time. Eventually, I notice people start to stare. Though before long, the staring grows worse. Young women begin... Oh god, they're looking at Karma. Young women begin following us, giggling from behind. It turned to Karma looks like he hasn't slept in days. Karma. Sorry, princess, but I'm not in the mood to talk. Those girls are walking right behind us. This is... His curse? Karma. Natalie just said that I'm in no mood to talk. Did he not hear me? We're being followed. <gasps> he stares behind us almost stupidly and then laughs hollowly at the, when the girls see his face. They start to rush toward us, but their voices rising. Their voices rising and blending together into a horrendous cac cacophony. Karma's not moving, though. He looks resigned. Maybe he's too tired to realize what he wants to do. So, uh... We <laughs> tie my grip on Karma's hand and pull him away. My pace quickening to a run as the girls chase after us, screaming at me angrily for taking Karma away from him. It's like a, some rocks are like groupies. Ah! Chase after Karma. Natalie, what are you doing? Getting us out of here, dumbass. Natalie. I lead him through the town and into little nooks and crannies where I manage to lose some of the crowd. This is quite a night. Karma often led me through some of these spaces or as shortcuts. Waltz knew them too. Once we are alone again, I stop, falling my knees and letting go of Karma's hand as I catch my breath. That really was a curse having to run away for so many ridiculous, my, so many mindless women. That was difficult. Natalie? What? I did not mean to snap, but the tiredness is pressing on me too. You held me out of that. Of course it did. Why would I want to be chased by girls? It's kind of weird. You could have left me behind and gone on alone. Instead, you helped me. You helped me too. I guess I paid you back. Though, I, to be honest, I wasn't even thinking about repaying him for saving me. I just knew that I didn't want Karma to be stuck trying to fend off all of those girls. <clears throat> he was right about his curse. That is terrible. I just realized something. Karma kneels down beside me and waits for me to speak. My curse is people forget me, and yours is even strangers become fascinated with you. It's almost like our curses are opposites of each other, and yet... Yet? Yet we seem so similar. My eyes widen when I realize what I just said. We are similar, aren't we? He holds out his good hand on me, and I let him le lead me back to the tavern through the abandoned alleyways. My feet are heavy, and all I want to do is sleep, but suddenly Karma's standing before me, his face grave. Natalie, I have to thank you for helping me earlier. I'm sorry if I was like that and made it more difficult on you. It was so sudden, and I was so tired of motivation to move. Shouldn't I be thanking you? I'll accept your thanks, even though I wish you didn't have to thank me in the first place. You should not have gone out of your own when you knew how dangerous it could be for you. I am sorry. I'll accept your apology too because I lost sleep over this. I have no words to for how I feel right now. Princess. Oh, he kisses my hand. Karma reaches for my hand again and this time holds it up and kisses the back of it. Suddenly all my tiredness falls away. We really are a handful. But a delightful handful. I'm going to bandage this hand and then rest. We'll speak later about all of this, okay? But the blood. The bleeding stopped on its own, Natalie, but it does need to be treated. Don't worry, it'll be fine. Are you sure? As sure as I can be, I don't lie, not even for the sake of a pretty lady. Karma led, uh, lets my hand go as soon as we enter the Martian, and then bows politely to me before heading back to his room. I watch him go, my mind warrowing. Does he usually kiss women's hands? It's an old-fashioned thing to do. No, I don't think so. Okay, next is chapter six, matchmaking. You really are. You really are a handful. But a delightful handful. 
His words kept repeating in my head. I could not stop hearing his voice and feeling his lips on my hand. My face feels warm, and every time I think about his words, my heartbeat feels st unsteady. I really have stopped thinking about that. Karma is karma, and he puts on that overly polite act with everyone. But then I'm pretty sure I've never seen him do something like that with another person. I'll just go downstairs and stop thinking about all of this. I need to tell Parfait and Delora what happened. Because of the time I'd re because of the time I had returned to the Martian yesterday, I never spoke to anyone about what happened. Maybe someone's downstairs. Someone usually is. I leave my room and make my way downstairs to the reception. It is quiet when I enter, but not as silent as I thought it would be. Karma's sitting at one of the tables, speaking quietly with Parfait and Delora. Oops. This injury hand is sitting on the ba uh, table, bandaged. I cannot help but stare at it, my heart plummeting. His injury is my fault. So, you have yet to hear the entire story? No, I'm afraid I'm not quite privy to the information Waltz has. Is that correct? Waltz has been directly involved in this far longer than you have. What about Waltz? <gasps> Princess, you're up early. They all turn to look at me as I stand at the table. Karma still looks tired and is not in his dress. He looks somber, but still smiles at me. Natalie, how nice of you to join us. When did you start saying my name without my title? Natalie, you've run into a lot of different mishaps this week, haven't you? I thought you would be stubbornly avoiding work. Instead, you go out of your way to get yourself into trouble. This involves me directly. How would I not be curious? You've also been irresponsible, speaking out without any of us knowing. I have the freedom to do whatever I want to. I even wore a cloak to... Oh no, the cloak. I left it at the bar. I feel an edge of my arm and Karma's holding out my cloak with a tired smile. You went back to get this? When? Yesterday, when you were still in bed. You've been running yourself dry these last few days, Karma. It's nothing. Thank you. What's this? Our ice princess is thanking someone? Why is that something so strange? Oh, come now. She's not so... Oh, come now. She's not so icy. Natalie is more fire than anything. She's filled with unbridled passion and confidence. Confidence has gotten me nowhere so far. Don't look so dour, Natalie. You've become quite the accomplished woman. Carmen gestures toward me and I flush, unsure of what he is talking about. Then I notice Dolores' eyes are on me, too. Oh, parfait. I mean, oh, parfait. Do you see that? What are they looking at? I reach down to grab my necklace and pause. I cannot stop the gas that leaves my lips. Oh, we got half the necklace. <laughs> when did this happen? Princess, you didn't realize there was an extra piece to your necklace? Congratulations, Princess Natalie. You're a step closer to breaking your curse. I feel proud. I only ever felt this way around Mother. She did me a great favor yesterday. If not for Natalie, I might have suffocated beneath a pile of very excited women. Wait, and helping Karma escape was a good deed? She was selfless. He's not even mentioning the injury got protecting me. Parvain and Delora both smiling, but the cheerful mood does not last long. What were you all talking about before I came down? About your kidnapping. Well, kidnappings. Both of them. It looks like we have a serious problem in our hands. What do you know about this? What does Waltz know that I don't? Princess, it's more about... What everyone else knows that you don't. What everyone else knows? I feel anger begin to simmer inside of me. Even though he looks apologetic, he says it so casually. What are you all hiding from me? Let's gather everyone later, shall we? I think Waltz might want to wait for here for this, too. What does Waltz have to do with any of it? Be patient, princess. You've already waited this long. What's another few hours? I have no choice but to agree with when Parfait and Delore refuse to say any more, but I'm not happy about it. I spend the rest of my time doing idle chores around the tavern. I do a round of sweeping with Mr. Broom and mindlessly organize some of the bottles. I cannot believe everyone knows something about me that I don't. But now, I'll find out the entire story. Maybe we'll answer some of the questions I, ha I have. But why are they keeping things about me as a secret to begin with? 
Dolor gathers everyone in the tavern to discuss the kidnappings. I decide to send in between Waltz and Karma. So we have so we have a story to tell. Story time, huh? I don't suppose this would be a romance, would it? How can you stand to make comments like this constantly, constantly? How can you stand to live a lie? The two glare at each other across the table, but Dolores silences them. Dolores starts with a story about the Great War. One that I have already heard so many times, I can recite it myself. What does any of this have to do with me? Because the fairy tales, witches like myself, were punished for simply existing. Our leader, the Tenenbaum Bearer, was a kind witch that was overtaken by the grief that her people suffered. She was driven so far into madness that she created the fairy tale curse to punish humans and make them suffer as the witches had. And when that wasn't enough, she committed the ultimate taboo. She killed a human. I tried to stop her, but by the time I thought to act, it was too late. Knowing that Delore and Parfait were involved in the Great War makes it seem more real. But wasn't Ten and Bronbera killed? How can the fairy tale curse continue to spread if she is dead? I believe that the Ten and Bronbera sacrificed the last bit of her life to continue powering the Ten and Brom. Oh, my bad. Totally read that in the wrong voice. I believe that the Ten and Brom Bearer sacrificed the last bit of her life to continue to power the Ten and Brom. Also ensure that the remaining witches could continue spreading the fairy tale curse. Is none of this ringing a bell for you? What are you talking about? She really did erase your memories. Erase? The witch who died. The Ten Brown Bear was your mother, Princess Natalie. <gasps> what? For some reason, I turned to look at Karma, who is one of the only people who doesn't look away from me. I grew up outside of this kingdom, and even I knew of the terrible witch Hildur. Hildur. You expect me to believe any of this? Mother was. She wasn't a witch. I would remember that. Well, you would if you had memories of the war. And the years before that. Under Hyder, Hyder, Hilder's rule, the palace was a dark place. The king didn't have any real power until Hilder was defeated. That goes for the rest of us, too. We were slaves to Hilder. Dolores' eyes flickered to Waltz. It's the truth. Waltz knows him because he is also a witch. He experienced Hilder's command over the witches firsthand as well. <gasps> Waltz is a witch? Sorry for keeping it a secret, princess. It's not as if I can use much magic anymore anyway. Not when I'm cursed. That's just another secret of many. It seems everyone is hiding something. Everyone was freed after Hilder's reign. Witches, fairies, and humans alike. The king was even able to marry Ophelia, the woman he always truly loved. So, it has always been Ophelia that he truly loved. Was that the reason I never felt any love from him? Because it was my mother's daughter? He gave up on me. No, dear, I don't think he... He gave up on me. My voice is too loud in the reception area. I felt it crack beneath the pressure and suddenly I want to cry. My mother told me so many times not to cry. The king gave up on me. But mother didn't. Mother would tell me this was all a lie. She would tell me not to trust anyone. They must be lying. I turned to karma. For some reason, I trust him more than I trust Dolores Parfait. Is this the truth? I was told the story of Hilda and her daughter Natalie. They said you were the picture of elegance, but that you shared your mother's icy nature. <gasps> but I don't think that's true at all. If Hilda was ice, then you most certainly are warm fire. If my mother was a witch then, what does that make me? You're a witch as well, whether or not you were ever taught to use magic. On your upcoming birthday, you will become the Tenebron Bearer. Do you realize how ridiculous this all sounds? Me, a witch. The king never said anything. And now I cannot even ask him if this is the truth because I'm cursed. Why would he even curse me? We didn't want to repeat the tragedy, Natalie. I sent your shelves for almost a year, princess. There was ice in your heart, and if you had inherited the Tenebrom in that state, who knows what would have happened. Evil! Then why didn't you just tell me any of this? Delore and Parfait looks at each other, look at each other before dropping their gazes to the ground. If we had told you before, would you have been bothered to listen? The king must have tried to do the same thing, and look how that turned out. You shut out everyone who ever tried to tell you about Hilda's true nature. That, that is probably true. Even now I'm having trouble believing that they are telling me the truth. The whole world feels as if it is crumbling, collapsing around me. I need to escape, I need to go out and be somewhere else, but... Why are the witches looking for me? You are the heir to the Tenebrom, no doubt the evil witches want you on their side so that they can continue wrecking havoc in Anjali with the fairy tale curse. The men that were looking for Natalie were not witches, though. They were knights. Perhaps the witches and the knights are working together. 
This must be part of Alcaster's scheme to steal the throne. What are you talking about? The reason why Garland and I left the Order of Caldera was because the king did not believe us about Alcaster's quote, coop. How would he know of the princess's identity, though? Anyone who is in a witch of fairy is in curse shouldn't be able to remember her. But now we know that it is not just the witches looking for the princess, but the knights of the Order of Caldera as well. They definitely have a description of her from someone. Natalie? Karma reaches out a hand and touches my shoulder, and I flinch back before standing up. I cannot speak about this now. I want to be alone. Prince, let her go. She'll need a lot of time to think. I leave everyone sitting at the table as I try to process some whirling thoughts in my mind. Hildur, my mother, the only person I ever thought loved me, was a Tenenbaum bearer witch, the first witch to kill a human. The witch that started the fairy tale curse. All this time, I thought Mother was the only one who cared, but what if she never did? I stay in my room for a long time trying to process everything I've been told. Okay. Days go by before I decide to leave the tavern again and watch Karma practice with the knights. These last few days, I felt hollow. Maybe seeing the normal practices will help me feel better. Maybe it'll make things feel like nothing's changed. When I arrive at the forest, however, only Karma is standing in this clearing. He's staring through the trees as if he sees something there, but his expression is solemn, almost sad. Eventually he sighs, shaking his head before turning in my direction. <gasps> Natalie. I prepare myself for a response, but find that no words come to mind. I've not spoken to Karma since they, the talk about mother and witches, and met any of the ease I felt with him before he has slipped away. Still, I came here on my own, and I cannot just stand there with being mute. I say the first thing that comes to mind. Where are Warren and Garland? I'll only train with Garland. Warren is on patrol duty tonight. He'll be here later. I just came early. It seems like you did too. Natalie, are you okay? I'm sorry I haven't been by to see you. It is not as if you owned that to me. I don't owe it to you, but I truly wanted to. I've just been busy these last few days scouting the town for information. As much as I want you to come with me. Why would you ever have wanted to pair up with someone like me anyway? Why, Princess? That's because you're... I'm bitter and cold, and even though I want to change, all I can think about is myself. But now, I want to change because I do not want to be the same as my mother. Isn't that selfish? Maybe so, but I believe you're being selfish for the right reasons. An entirely selfless person can't survive in this world. Because we can make others happy. We have to be happy ourselves. Happy? Ourselves? Yes, an angry person holds resentment toward everyone. Mm. And it is whatever good deeds I seek to do. That is why I cannot complete my good deeds. Wrong, you've already got one done. Recognizing the need for change is always a good thing, Natalie. Regardless of the motivation, you're trying to become a better person. That is what matters. He takes a fork toward me, then puts his hands on my shoulders and leans down until I can look right into his eyes. Karma Steer's expression startles me as much as his touch. It is never too late for anyone to change. You taught me that. What? How can I have taught Karma anything? Do you mind if I tell you a story, Natalie? He's standing too close. Don't move. With his face so close, all I can do is stare right into his eyes. Karma's hands drain on my shoulders, and for a few moments, I feel a slight panic rising on my chest. Then Karma steps away from me with a rough shake of his head. Karma? Next time I do that, Natalie, feel free to push me away. That was a switch of moods. That was ridiculous. What? It's better that way. What does he mean by that? You never answered. Will you listen to my story? All right. Once upon a time in a land far, far away, there lived a crown prince from a kingdom called Brugantia. Brugantia is one of the neighboring kingdoms, so this is a make-believe. His name was Claude Audric Rinaldi Matthias Almonte. But because the name was such a mouthful, he settled for an acronym and nickname, at least around the palace where it was acceptable. Claude Adric. Karma. Prince Claude was a man who flaunted his beauty and talents to all that he met. That's him, basically. He often used his title to get what he wanted. Prince Claude was a selfish person, man, who felt he was entitled to everything that he had. He was vain and often left his castle unattended so that he could avoid his responsibilities. Then one day, he changed upon a beautiful maiden in the town square. He led around the whole day, being as charming as he possibly could. And then at the end of the day, he asked the woman to be his lover. She agreed, but their time together did not last long. Only weeks later, Prince Claude threw her away as one throws away an object and broke the woman's heart. 
and she cursed him. That beautiful maiden was a witch, but Prince Claude found out too late. The witch said she would make his beauty as vanity a curse, to make even beauty a curse. Ashamed of being cursed, Prince Claude doned a disguise and left the kingdom behind. He has been gone for nearly a year now, most probably assume he is dead. But in truth, the prince had come to Anjali seeking a way to break his curse. He had heard of a young na lady named Natalie who, on her 18th birthday, could dispel any curse. Karma. He looks so sad. I don't know how to com comfort him. Claude? <gasps> Karma. Claude. He turns a startling red as he stares at me. For a few moments, he does not speak. He's embarrassed. Then he bursts out laughing. I stare at him in shock, understanding his reaction. Feel myself lush. Isn't that your real name? No, darling, it is. But here you see my name. Well, it sounds so much softer out of your lips. I rather like it. My cheeks are warm again. How is it that he is always able to make me feel this way? I will call you by that name if it makes you so happy. Let's make it a secret between the two of us. I'm still Miss Karma here. Besides, I'd rather have kept that name for my ears only. It makes me feel more special that way. More? Special? At that moment, Garland shows up for practice and Claude politely excuses himself. I watch the two of them trade blows. Claude favors his other hand, but his blow still comes quickly, even with his injury. The more karma, I mean, Claude, tells me, the more I realize that he's like me, a noble cursed for being selfish. But how do I help break his curse? Why can't he tell me? As practice is drawing to a close, Claude asks Garland the usual question. Have you confessed to Warren yet? Garland only shakes his head in reply. The two men sheathe their swords. Garland looks almost sad as he turns to make his way back to the tavern. He likes her, and yet he won't say anything. Why is that frustrating me so much? Garland... Yes, princess? You have to tell Warian. Claude told me to be for that confessing is hard, but what Garland is going through looks even harder. Princess, you know I'm incapable. No, you think you're incapable, but if you never say anything to her, you'll never know. If I say something wrong, I risk losing everything that I already have with her. And if you say nothing, you risk losing what you could have had with her. Natalie is right. Yes. Maybe you should really tell her, Garland. But before Claude was adamant that Gar But before... Claude was adamant that Garland shouldn't confess to Warren. What changed? If I mess this up. Hmm, let's try looking at it through another lens. Imagine the Warren is Natalie. How do you think she would like to be confessed to? I frown the two men, arms crossed. Excuse me? Well, you and Warren are very similar, both very straightforward. C confess to the princess? My eyes moved to Claude, but only fleetingly before they're once again on Garland. You just need to do something simple, Garland. Something that will not rub her the wrong way. A maiden's heart is ever fragile, and each woman is different. True, like every guy is different. Claude is wearing an amused smile on his face, but he is looking at me, not Garland. I feel my face flush and I have to look away. Natalie, your tomato red again. It's adorable. I cross my arms over my rapidly beating heart again and force the scowl on my face. No, <laughs> I was just thinking about what Garland could do. Something simple, like when Karma kissed my hand, I... Garland kissing Warren's hand is probably not a good idea. Maybe he could do what Claude and I did that one day in town. He can buy her some food and they can just talk. Garland, have you ever just asked Warren out for food? Not alone. Warren is practical and she always eats at the tavern. She also, oh, she's always also on, always on duty if she's available. I'll take her patrol ship two nights from now on, then and now, tomorrow. I can ask her out for a meal. We can make her invite a grand affair. We can draw banners on the walls or I can give you a rose. <gasps> That sounds like a terrible idea. I'm offended. I feel like if I did something like that for Warren, she would get embarrassed and punch me. Sounds like another young lady, another lady that I know. Claude grins at me, but I just roll my eyes. Garland, just ask her normally. And then when you're out and alone together, you can confess. And we'll make sure you have the time to do it. I'll purposefully come late to practice tomorrow night so you can ask her out of that date. How does that sound? You two really think I can do this? You just have to ask the question. Whatever follows will at least be an answer. Tomorrow night, then. Good man. I'm sure we'll go swimmingly. Or I could just drown. You won't drown, Garland. Garland excuses himself with a nervous smile before Claude turns to me expectantly with a mischievous grin. Now, Natalie, we'll come here early tomorrow and spy on them. We need to scope out a good spot. Spy on them? Of course. We need to make sure that our efforts pay off. I don't think we should. You don't want to see how it plays out. I mutely shake my head, unable to put my emotions into words. For some reason, I'm imagining myself in Warian's position. It feels too personal. Claude's likeliness, likeness, 
likeliness suddenly springs to mind and I feel my face grow hot again. Natalie, you've been oddly out of it today. Claude reaches out a hand toward me, then abruptly pulls away. I stare as he smiles at me almost sheepishly. <coughs> <coughs> the conversation between us dies and we return the Martian. Days pass, and though I did not spy on the conversation between War and Garland, I noticed that Garland had been smiling from ear to ear during his practice with Gla Claude recently. I can only assume that his confession went well. Claude took the patrol ship tonight, and as I lay in bed, I'm restless. Every time I watch Claude practice with Warren and Garland, I'm reminded of the palace of Fritz. I wonder how Fritz is doing. Is he still practicing with the other knights? My thoughts darken as I recall the kidnappings. Claude had to save me every single time. He got injured saving me. Unable to sleep, I slip out of bed and make my way to the reception room. The night air is cool and no one stops me from standing just outside of the Martian. I cannot just sit back and do nothing anymore. I have to act. I do want, do not want Claude to get hurt because of me again. Eventually, I see Claude approach. He looks tired and is moving more slowly than usual, but when he sees me in his lips, quirk into a smile. Natalie, what are you doing out here tonight, love? Love, instead of darling, that's new. Hello, Claude. His face is dark red again. If you're using my real name, I suppose you've come to ask for something serious. How could he know that? I do need to ask something of you. Well, if you need a shoulder to cry on, I'm here, love. What? Oh, is this not about... Never mind. I'm asking if you will be my instructor. For some reason, I soon have caught Claude of guard. He stares at me for a few moments. What? I want to learn how to use a sword, and I want you to be my instructor. Claude's expression becomes uncharacteristically serious. I'd rather you didn't learn how to use a sword. I do not want you to have to keep protecting me. I don't mind protecting you. I do. Claude sighs and shakes his head. Princesses shouldn't be using swords. I want to be able to stand on my own two feet. You are. I do not want you to get hurt again when I could do something about it. Teach me, please. Claude? Once again, he flushes. It seems to be an instant reaction. It is both amusing and endearing. It won't be easy. I wasn't expecting it to be. Claude stares at me for a long time before finally letting out a heavy sigh. Fine, I'll train you. You won't learn in a day, but I can teach you the essentials. You can use one of the knight's training swords. The thank you. Music to my ears. Meet me in the clearing in ten minutes. Ten minutes? What? You said he wanted a train, so we will. Don't expect me to go easy on you. But aren't you tired? He looked exhausted when he came in, and now he wants to train. Already try to get out of training? I am not. Claude shakes his head, but he's smiling. I'll see you there in a few minutes, love. Moonlight spills through the leaves, illuminating the forest with gentle light. Long minutes pass, and as I stand in the clearing, I begin to feel restless. It isn't like Claude to be late. Is he tending to his injury? I hear rustling in the leaves and turn immediately to see that the disturbance is, but the minute I do, I am pulled back by a strong force, and my world goes dark. Before I can scream, I hear a gentle voice in my ears. Less than one, Natalie, when apprehended by an enemy they can't see, remain calm, and use your five senses to judge how best to get the upper hand. This voice is coming from right behind me. Ooh, okay. Claude, I become aware that this is the closest he's ever been to me, with my back pressed to his chest like this. Panicking disorients the mind, that is why you must remain cool under any circumstance. How could I not panic? Any normal person would panic. Still, I try to force myself to be calm. Less than two, enemies will often let down their guards when they think they have the upper hand. Catch your opponent off guard by remaining calm and locating his weaknesses with your senses. I try to calm myself as Claude instructs, and I feel it is a bit easier, but only because I know it is Claude. An opening. I move as quickly as I can, stepping forward so that I can swing an elbow back at Claude's stomach. Before that happens, Claude has pulled me back to him, closing whatever distance I had put between us. In the process, he moves his hand from my eyes to my mouth. I can once again I, I can once again see the forest, but my words are muffled beneath his hand. Another thing to remember, you won't always be able to catch your enemy off guard by throwing punches or hits at them. Your opponent will usually always be stronger than you, Natalie. Remember what I said about a weakness. Um, enemies will often let their guards down when they believe they are winning. Just like I have. An opening. A thought occurs to me as I glance around me and then down at Karma's bandaged hand. Karma's bandaged hand is over my mouth. Is this an opportunity or a trick? What will you do, Princess? What kind of tactic would remove you from my grasp? Uh, topple him. His hand is a clear opening, but I cannot damage his hand any further. I'll try to shift my weight against him if I take him by surprise. 
I push back against him as suddenly as I could possibly can. Claude makes a sound made of disapproval and does not budge. I change tactics, stubbing on his foot instead, but he only shifts his stance. Before I can think of what to try next, Claude moves and I am suddenly pinned on the ground. Karma 1, Natalie 0. That was a pretty good attempt to love, but not good enough, I'm afraid. I wasn't expecting to come at me like that. I was expecting sword practice. You weren't expecting a man to kidnap you in the alleyway, were you? I glare up at him, unable to say anything because he is right. You're oddly quiet. It is hard to find an op opening to hurt you when you are really, not really my enemy. He does not move but continues to stare at me. His face is close to mine, close enough to... Close enough to what exactly? Natalie, do you trust me to protect you? That's not the point. I need to be able to protect myself. Because you're planning investigating the witches on your own? No, I... I want to be able to protect myself because I do not want you getting hurt protecting me. Claude leans down and I can feel his hair on my cheek. For a few moments, everything slows to stop and all I can hear is my heartbeat and its slow breathing. Who wants to say your mind is something you don't let go, do you? Claude pulls away from me before I can respond. He's standing again, offering me a hand. He doesn't want to get too close. Let's get started with some sword work, then. The pleasant smile is back on his face. I can never tell what he's thinking at times like these. What are you really like, Claude? Chapter 7. Thorny Rose When I return to the Martian later that night, my hands are scratched, and I think I might have bruises on my arms. Claude was not joking when he said he would not go easy on me, but he did compliment me more than once. Natalie, I've hit you quite a few times and you haven't uttered a single complaint. Impressive. Crying is for the weak. Though everyone should be sleeping, I notice that the light is still on at the tavern. I see Warren and Garland up and at a table speaking with each other and laughing. If Claude had come back with me, he would be happy to see this. You two are still up? They are not even surprised when they turn to face me. Good days like the, this are even better when stretched. I haven't been off duty in a long time. Did you both have a good time tonight? It was great. Garland knows this little place in the town that I've never even heard of before. Oh, that's her. I notice that Warian is more energetic than usual, or smile a little wider than normal. I wonder if she's drunk. I'm gonna get another drink. Another drink? Garland leads in toward me, his voice hushed. We already bought a replacement bottle when we were out today. We would never take anything from the Martian without money. Right. Is Warian drunk? Oh no, Princess Tipsy, it's like a buzz fades a, fade a lot quicker. Oh. Garland watched. Well, Garland and I watch Warren as she refills her glass to the bar. I have to thank you, Princess. I would never have asked her out if you and Karma had an insistent on it. So you told her. Garland looks at me with a pleased smile. I'll take that as a yes. She didn't really realize until much later. I just asked her out for food and she thought that's all it was. Maybe Warren really did need to be told bluntly. What happened? I, uh, told her? And? We talked and remembered old times. He sounds like an old man. And I held her hand. I noticed Garland flinch over so slightly, but he is smiling, looks pleased with himself. And then the night's not over yet, so... He trails off with a hopeful smile before he raised his eyebrows at me. What about you and Karma? What about us? I've asked him to train me. Train? Princess, you've asked me to teach him to teach you how to use a sword? What's this? Our princess is going to be pick up a, is going to pick up a sword. Warren continues, returns to the table, but I'm too tired to per properly join in the conversation. I should leave them to their conversation head to bed. I need to get some rest. I want to start practicing at night. I excuse myself to head upstairs. I am startled awake by an excruciating bright light. It is momentary when it is over. I am sitting in my bed, dazed and confused. My eyes burn. My hand flies to pendant around my neck where I see the second glass slipper with another piece. <gasps> a second piece? <gasps> Ooh. There's another piece. But when did I do another good deed? I grasp the neck tightly, necklace tightly in my hand as I make my way to the tavern. I think I set them up. That was it. Everyone is doing their pre-morning chores when I get to the tavern area. I notice Carmen glaring off into space and then not far from him, the two knights. They haven't been up all night, have they? I make my way slowly over to them. Even back then you were like some kind of shadow, weren't you? <gasps> you don't have to hide it. It was obvious you were tailing me back then. I... It was only because I was worried about you. I realized. You really didn't have to follow me, Lan. 
Lan, okay, Garlan. But I'm glad you did. Lan, Warian. Oh, shush. Fritz used to call you that, too. La Lan is Garland's childhood nickname. He still gets embarrassed when I call him that. I see. So what are you two talking about? Oh, we were just reminiscing. I look at the two of them critically for a few minutes. Critically for a few minutes. Waiting for them to say something. They both exchange a glance before looking at me confused. Well? Well what? what? How did your date go last night? Garland makes a sound and turns bee red. Warren's eyebrows quirk and then she laughs. Oh, that. It went well. So well, in fact, they can see that the two of us are still very much enjoying each other's company. Warren is usually busy taking her rounds around the Martian, with a scowl on her face. She looks happier being here with Garland, more relaxed. You might even say that we're dating. Hmm? Isn't it funny how red he gets, Princess? Y you were blushing just as much yesterday when I... One more word, Lan, and I swear I'll punch you. The two of them are both blushing now, and this scene is oddly comical. Who knew the two great knights the Order Caldera could be so easily undone? Both of you are amusing to watch. The two of them stare at me, suddenly solemn-faced. I suddenly remember that one conversation the knights all had at the castle. They were talking about how they all per had personal reasons for being knights, despite the fact they were all served the king. I'd always thought Warren and Garland were stoic and honorable, that their only reason for becoming knights was a sense of justice. Seeing them here, though, without their stoic face facade, they feel more like people. My curiosity is piqued. Do you mind if I asked what your reason was for, were for becoming knights? Oh my. Oh, my father was a knight. He put his life on the line for the kingdom. Warian's father was a living legend in his own right, and he had the medals to back it up. My father wasn't around a lot, but I always admired him. Judging by the look on Warian's face, it is clear to me that she really loves her father. My mother died when I was young, and because my father couldn't be around all the time to take care of me, I ended up practically living with Lan and his family. Lan always got annoyed when I called him my brother. Now I know why. Warian wanted to follow in her father's footsteps. Then why did you join the knights, Garland? Because he wanted to watch over me. I, I, I never knew you blushed so easily, Garland. Garland sues to blush even harder at that, and Warian's laughter becomes infectious. I feel amuse amusement begin to bubble up as I watch the two of them. But a cold voice cuts through the la laughter in the atmosphere like a hot blade through ice. Could you keep it down over there? I turn to see the claw's eyes normally, so warm or cold. His usual smile is gone, replaced with a deep scowl. Oh, we're sorry. He's still glaring at the two of them. Oh, I can tell him about the necklace. Cl c karma I got another piece to my necklace, another good deed. Claude turns his gaze to me, but the frown doesn't disappear. That's nice, darling. His voice is calm, but flat and lacks any enthusiasm. That felt lackluster, and oddly disappointing. A good deed. Congratulations, Princess, you're close to breaking her curse. What did he get the good deed for? I'm not sure exact, actually. Hmm, maybe it was for helping Land confess? I hear you and Karma went out of your way to help make it happen. That happened yesterday, though. Maybe the magic was waiting to see what, because what became a garland knife. Claude makes a dismissive hand gesture from his table, frowning. If you two insist on being so affectionate, you should get a room. Affectionate. The Warren's smile has faded away with a dangerous scowl. Where Garland looks confused, Warren looks notably irritated. The shadow is still there on her, his face. Claude does not look okay at all. Um, probably gonna scold him. Comfort him? I think he'd get angrier. Um scold him. It doesn't matter if something is bothering him. It isn't like him to be so rude. Irritation is no excuse for rudeness. Fine, I apologize. Happy? He looks at me for a few moments. His expression twists into a defiant scowl, but he doesn't hold long. Moments later, his expression softens and he looks away, almost in shame. I'm sorry. This apology sounds real. But still, why do I feel so disappointed? Silence descends for a few moments before Claude abruptly stands up from his table. Excuse me. Claude turns briskly and heads upstairs, leaving me with the two knights. I wonder what's wrong with him. You think we've been running him too thin because of practice? I do not think it's you two. I get the feeling that Claude holds himself back from saying what he means sometimes. Sometimes he acts strange, distant, and recently is getting more and more moody. Um, princess? I look over my niece who is smiling apologetically. Sorry to interrupt, but Mr. Broom is getting kind of restless. Time to sweep, I suppose. 
Well, maybe cleaning will help get my mind off of things. The rest of the day goes by slowly. I'm stuck cleaning most of the day and then serving later. And at one point, I speak with Delora about the nights that had attempted to kidnap me. And she tells me that she and Perfect are meeting later to discuss their suspicions. I still don't understand what their suspicions are when Sir Alcaster cannot possibly know who I am. He's an evil dude. You'll see in a couple minutes. Uh, or on the next episode. Um... My hands are sore by the end of the night, but I still feel like I can practice with the sword. I've noticed that both Warren and Garland look restless too. Garland eventually leaves for a troll, while Warren um, remains at a table looking deep in thought. I do not want to bother, so I decide to try and find Claude. I go to his room, but find that the door is locked. Claude, Karma, are we training tonight? No answer. My heart sinks. Aww. Is he not speaking to me? Did I do something wrong? Okay. For days, Claude stayed in his room, only leaving when he had to be on patrol. A few times I saw Perfect go into his room, but she refused to talk with, about him what is bothering him. I feel so useless. When Claude did appear in the tavern or out in the town, he still had that terrible grimace on his face. Look, I really don't want to talk right now. If you're so frustrated me, why not just ignore me? No, I'm not going to train and I'm not in the right state of mind. I don't want to talk about it. Just leave me alone. Please. I think that was when I was trying to calm down. But I didn't. I unscolded him. I'm really beginning to worry about him. Today I'm in town running errands with Waltz for Parfait. It had been almost a week since Claude started acting so strangely, so I thought I needed to do something for him. I know he likes dresses, and he told me once that he likes roses, but can I really find something that would cheer him up? Perhaps he would like some jewelry. Waltz, do you remember where that jewelry store Karma likes is? I don't go there very often, so unfortunately, no. Princess, is this a good deed? Hmm. What are you doing right now? Did you think it would be a good deed? Good deeds need to be selfless, right? Generally, yes. I doubt this will count as selfless. I'm doing this to cheer Karma up. That sounds pretty selfless, but it's also so that he goes back to teach me how to fight instead of sulking in his room. You yeah, have heard that Karma's been teaching you how to use a sword. Why do you want to learn how to fight? Because I want to be able to protect myself. And it's not like I can use magic. At least sword fighting gives me an advantage. I'm sorry, Princess. I wish I could teach you magic, but it doesn't work when you're under a curse. But only on your 18th, but on your 18th birthday, when you become the Ten of Brown Bear, you'll be able to use magic. I'll instruct you if you want me to. That would be nice. Though that does not solve my current problem. What would share Claude up? Walt starts chuckling beside me and I turn to look at him, confused. Karma is important to you, isn't he? He's my partner, and he's helped me. He has also been patient with me and smiled even when I've said some really inconsiderate things to him. I'm glad, Princess, that he's your friend. My friend? Claude does not feel like a friend. He feels like something else. Oh, Princess, is this the one you were searching for? Waltz points to a peddler sporting different kinds of jewelry, and I instantly make my way toward it. There are all kinds of glittering things displayed, and for a few moments, I feel myself drawn to everything. Then I notice the price tags. I barely have any money left from when the king gave me that pouch. I cannot afford any of this. Maybe we should do our errands first, then look for a gift. Maybe we'll find something as we look through the stores. But if I don't get Claude's gift today, I might not be able to give it to him tonight. Princess? Let's look for Karma's gift first. I know the errands are important, but I really need to find Claude a gift. Is it so wrong to put him first? I should be able to find him something soon. Do you have something else in mind for him? No, but it shouldn't take too long to find him something. I'll follow you leave your lead then, Princess. The two of you us walk around town for at least an hour, searching for gifts, but nothing stands out to me. I slowly feel myself becoming frustrated knowing that I have wasted so much time. And we haven't even done the errands yet. Maybe Waltz was right. We should have done the errands first. I've wasted a lot of time, haven't I? We're fine, Princess. It will just take us a little longer to get back to the Martian. We spent a little, few hours gathering supplies needed for the tavern, and only then did we start looking again for Claude's gift, so we did the opposite route. Princess, I can hold more of these bags for you. It's fine. I'm used to carrying lots of bags. Does Karma make you carry them around? Princess, you should really tell him off. He does a lot of other things for me, but next time? Next time I think I will. So long as he gets out of his room sometime soon. I really hope he does. Hey, Princess. But now the problem is finding something that he'll like. What is Claude like? Princess. There's no reason for you to shout. Walt shakes his head at me, but he's smiling. 
Let me offer you a deal. A deal? If you help me set up one of the, my puppet shows, I'll pay you. You earn money from your puppet shows? I get tips, so what do you say? I won't go easy on you, though. Yes, I'll help you. Why do you seem so surprised? I was just thinking that everyone's right. You re you've really changed, princess. Maybe having Karma as a partner really was a good idea. Being partners with Claude may have changed me for the better, but I doubt I have done the same for him. I'm sure Karma would be very happy that you're buying him a gift. Receiving gifts from admirers isn't the same thing as you getting him something. He receives gifts from admirers. For a few moments, I think about the women who chased us in town a few weeks ago, and I feel a little unpleasant stab in the heart. Small things. A man will treat him to a desert every so often. I saw a lot of it when we did errands together. I always make Karma accept those gifts without killing the man. Killing the man? It's dramatic, but sounds like Karma. He punched Rumble when he asked him to marry him, joke or not. Karma wears his disguise to be convincing, but then gets away with people falling for it. He's still very much a child. You know how he is. He doesn't like being flirted with. Waltz, do you know anything else about Karma's curse? His curse? He never really talks about it. Claude may be even more stubborn than me if he is not letting anyone help him with his curse. Waltz and I continue our search for a gift. Waltz tells me that I can look for something a bit more expensive and that he'll just put me to work on another day by helping him with his puppets. I return the jewelry peddler we found early, earlier. Hello, madam, sir. What can I help you with today? Do you have any sort of rose-shaped jewelry here? The man refers me to a box full of many different rose-shaped earrings. He then shows me necklaces, and I realize belatedly that it is as if I am searching for something from his karma, not Claude. My eyes scan the glass, nearly in defeat, before a little rose catches my attention in the back of the display window. It has a chain connected to it, but doesn't seem long enough to be a necklace. What's this one? That's your symbol rose pendant, ma'am. It l comes with a chain, but it can also be pinned on the chest, so it comes off. Uh, the man takes it out of the display case so I can look at it. Nice. Nice. This is fancy, but not completely flashy. I feel a little click as I press my fingers to the pendant and I realize that it can also open. Oh yes, yeah, so you can also put something small inside of its pendant. This is perfect. I look at the price tag and after making sure that it's not too expensive, I pay the shopkeeper. Waltz pays him the additional fee and then we walk back toward the Martian together. When we return the Martian, I go to my room to tuck the locket into a drawer before I head to the tower and finish the rest of my chores. Just as I expect that Claude is not downstairs today either. Warren and Garland have taken a training with each other, though they seem agitated that Claude is not helping them. At the end of the day, I hurry to my room where I write a few words on a piece of paper that I put into the locket. A normal rose would have withered, so I offer this one instead in heartfelt thanks. I hold the locket tightly in my hand and start toward Claude's room. Why is my heart beating so fast? I'm just giving him a gift. I have a crush! I pause at Claude's door, remembering the last time I entered his room. I'm sure it's okay if I just go in. I open up the door to Claude's room, which is thankfully not locked, and step inside. Claude is sitting motionless in front of his mirror, shoulders slumped as he stares at his reflection. He's shirtless, and there's that tattoo. It seems different. Claude does not notice me at first, and notice that his hand goes to the tattoo over his chest, and then I hear him heave a heavy sigh. Slowly I close the door behind me. It clicks, and that is when he suddenly turns to look at me. At first, there is just shock on his face, and then suddenly anger. Again, why do you do this again? <laughs> again, why do you do this again, Natalie? Oh, that's what he says. Uh, let's do it. I came to give you something. I tightly grip the lock in my hand so I stare at him. And this was so important, so very essentially, I once again missed knocking on my door for simple delivery. This voice slices through my heart. I wanted it to be a surprise. I'm not in the mood for surprises, princess. Right, but that was the right decision here. And I, I don't think he would have wanted to talk to me, though. In no time at all, Claude is suddenly right in front of me, his hands outstretched, and ooh, he's pinning me. Ooh, kind of. Mm, uh, and, sorry. <laughs> Stretching either side of me, pinning me in the wall against the door. Ooh, he's rough. His face is so close, his expression is so fierce, I cannot even bring myself to think of a way out. The only thing I can do is stare at him levelly, without getting angry, without crying. I will not show any weakness. Why? Why are you struggling or screaming at me? That's when the Natalie that I know would do. Then you do not know me as much as you think you do. And you know nothing about me. I already have a retort prepared when I stop realizing he is right. I barely know anything about him. No, I don't, but I like to. Why do you insist on poking your nose into others' business? We're partners. That's the only reason it has to be. I am supposed to help you, so why do you keep secrets from me? Help me? 
His voice and lips quirk, but his smile is sardonic. Claude, I want to help you. And the silence that descends between us, I find that I cannot help but look at Claude's tattoo and the thorns twirling around the rose. It is beautiful, but it also seems so lethal. When I glance at Claude again, he looks crustfallen, his eyes glittering like he might be on the verge of tears. Secrets are secrets for a reason, Princess. You should know that. If I could speak about them, I would, but I can't. And you bursting into my room that I notice only makes it harder. Harder for what? Princess, you can't imagine what this all feels like. What is he talking about? And that woman. I thought we were meant to be. He's not over her. She was so lovely. Her smile is bright as the sun. She's a witch. Why would he leave what? Clyde's eyes are far away. That's why never again. Poor dude's been hurt. But then you ruin everything, Natalie. Coming down like... It's my fault? I push my hands against Claude's chest, catching him off guard and force him to stumble back. I cannot take any of this. If I've ruined everything, then I'll just leave. You can have all the time in the world to yourself, then. Sometimes that's how I feel. The locket I bought for him burns in my hand, and I end up throwing it at his feet. Natalie, wait! I ignore him as I run from the room. So sad. When I return to my room and lock my door, I feel too hollow inside for tears. It hurts to breathe when I think of Claude. I eventually manage to fall asleep, but only have snatches of restless dreams my eyes fall close. Finally close. Mother, are you and father in true love? Like the fairy tales? I thought I'd forbid you to speak of fairy tales. Have you been reading them? No, no, mother. I've heard someone in the palace talking about them today. Then I shall have to find that person make sure they know what an appropriate topic conversation in the palace is. But, but mother, the true love and fairy tales sound so nice. Do you think I can fall in love true love with a prince? Dearest one, true love like that does not exist, but the love between a mother and her child is the truest kind. Not not really, but have an animal too. It cannot be replicated by anything else. Okay, clearly don't like animals, just your daughter. All other kinds of love is an illusion. <laughs> Excuse you. My love is all you will ever need. Do you understand me, my heart? She's taking control of her daughter like that. This is toxic. Yes, mother. Yes, mother. Sorry. <laughs> Chapter 8, The Lost Prince. This will be the next part.